Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, John McAllister, and I'm chair of the board. And I'd like to call this meeting to order. And I would ask uh, director if you would take roll call, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everybody. This is our roll call for our special board meeting, August 26, 2020. Trustee Barry. Trustee Cram. Trustee Danaher. Present. Thank you. Trustee Jacobs. Present. Thank you. Vice Chair McPherson. Present. Thank you. Chair McAllister. Present. Thank you. Trustee McRae. I'm present too, Steve. Thank you, sir. Trustee McDonald. Present. Thank you. Trustee Parisian. Present. Thank you. Trustee Schooler. Trustee Swan. Present. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, you have quorum. Thank you, uh, Director Slewa. Uh, the next move is for approval of the agenda. Uh, you have the motion in front of you. Uh, I'm going to assume that it is moved by Trustee Danaher and uh, seconded by Trustee Parisien. Uh, all those in favor, please cast your ballots online. I'm in favor. Trustee Parisien, I'm in favor. I'm in favor too. I'm just uh, having some technical issues. Okay. Chair McAllister, I'm just waiting on two more votes. Trustee Jacobs, in favor. <coughs> Chair McAllister, that motion carries. Thank you, uh, Lisa. Are there any conflict of interest uh, declarations? Hearing none, I'm going to proceed then. We'll get into the uh, business of the, uh, the evening. I just have a very few comments about this. We, uh, COVID uh, was not invented by the Upper Canada District School Board, and uh, it's not our fault or anybody else's for that matter. And we are trying to fly a plane as we build it. It, it, it is complex. The complexity of the reopening of school for our director and his senior team, given the current ministerial directives, is extremely complex. That has been complicated in a welcome kind of way by yesterday's federal ingestion of new funding for the provinces, uh, making the startup of classes for our frontline principals, classroom teachers, EAs and support staff even more mind boggling. This evening, in this brief hour or more, you will uh, understand why and also how the uh, UCDSB is attempting to address the issues. Parents, uh, no one knows better than me how difficult this must be for you. Surely you see the obstacles and challenges we face, but we find ourselves still in a pan pan pandemic crisis. I, I ask for everyone's patience as we face this challenge together. We will now proceed with Update number one, and I would like to introduce uh, Superintendent Rutter. Uh, the director, would you like to start this off before I introduce uh, Superintendent Rutters? Mr. Chair, thank you. And I just want to take a few moments to um, echo a couple of comments that you had. Uh, first of all, that the staff is pleased to be back here. While we weren't anticipating uh, that since last week's uh, significant meeting of the board, 
we, we would, would, would be back. But I think what that uh, flags for the, uh, our Board of Trustees and certainly for the public at large is how quickly things are moving and how important it is to try to keep people up to date the best that we can with the information that we have at hand at this very moment. Uh, further to your comments, Mr. Chair, we also appreciate as staff the patience of the board and of the public, our students and their parents, as we work through these many issues around delivering school program. That's in a very constrained set of timelines in circumstances, as you mentioned, Mr. Chair, that are unfamiliar. So as example, as a society, as a local community, we've never opened schools before with uh, this level of enhanced health measures, and yet it's very important that we have them in place. There's also greater expectations. There's new opportunities, and these are changing and evolving every day and sometimes hourly. And as you can appreciate, uh, Mr. Chair uh, and the Board of Trustees, these are complex matters that take reflection and consideration uh, to resolve, and we're using uh, everybody's time and energies and intelligence to do that. I want to assure the Board that we have been working late evenings and on weekends to, to get as close as we can to get clear and focus on the things that matter most to families. And that is, of course, uh, getting schools ready and getting our students ready to know what to expect in their programs. Uh, lastly, Mr. Chair, I just want to say that our focus has remained steadfast, as you saw in our school reopening uh, operation guide uh, two weeks ago, we brought to the board's attention about maintaining safe, clean, supportive school settings. And it's also about making sure that we're delivering on the multiple choices of learning experiences that the province has directed school boards to engage, uh, design, and implement that that notice came three weeks ago. For our in-person school operations, it means that we have to give our principals and our school staff enough time so that they can respond to <clears throat> these rapid uh, changes, uh, participate in training, uh, re configure or design the environments and feel confident that we're all ready to receive students. And you'll hear about that this evening, Mr. Chair and, and trustees. We also want to make sure that we can be responsive to parent um, choice that as you had heard at the beginning of the week uh, through um, uh, our update to the board and to the community that we have 80% uh, of parents who have selected uh, for their children a return to in-person learning in September. But what was uh, not as anticipated, and we'll talk about that uh, further this evening with the presentation from superintendents, is that there was a, an upswing in the number of families that were choosing remote learning for their children uh, beyond what we anticipated from our July um, survey to parents and families. So um, please, Mr. Chair, uh, our pleasure to bring forward to you tonight these updates. We know that uh, trustees will have questions and staff have been preparing for those questions and will pro uh, provide to the board as much information as we have at hand uh, to the best of our understanding. And if we don't have that information yet, when it becomes known, we'll make sure that also the board is fully apprised. So Mr. Chair, I'll turn that back over to you and thank you. Thank you, Director. I'll call upon uh, Superintendent uh, Susan Rudders to provide update number one. Superintendent Rutters, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, we are clear. Great. Great. So through you, Chair, it is my pleasure to provide this update to the board regarding the current state and the ongoing planning that we are engaging to serve the remote learning option in our board for the 2021 school year. Our initial planning and discussion about this school year began in late June and has been ongoing throughout the summer. The scope of our work was shaped by specific direction from the Ministry of Education provided to all boards on July 30th. And at that time, the Ministry stated that all students would have the opportunity to choose to study in person in their community school or remotely during the 2021 school year. We immediately began to model out scenarios around how the learning needs of students learning remotely could be met. And our goal as always was to provide the most flexibility to our students and families, recognizing that the choice before them would be a challenging one, of course, to engage. 
We received further specific direction from the Ministry of Education on August 13th, and this direction included an obligation to provide several variations of remote learning, including synchronous online instruction with real-time digital connection with the teacher and other students throughout the course of the school day. It also involved asynchronous online instruction where students engage independent learning online at any time and the option for non-digital programs using pen and paper when digital connection or digital engagement was not possible. So at that point, the task at hand was to provide our best description of the intended remote learning program and to provide parents and students with the opportunity to tell us which option they intended to engage for their child. And we accomplished this via two communications and one was the initial draft of our return to school guide. And the second, of course, was the confirmation of attendance survey. The confirmation of attendance survey resulted in a significantly higher number of students selecting remote learning than we as a senior staff had anticipated. Our high end modeling in advance of the survey was based on predictions of 10% of the student population choosing remote learning. The reality when the survey closed was more than double this amount with 20% of our students selecting remote learning. So this significant number of students who have selected remote learning, which was 4,452 in total, really when you think about it, that's the equivalent of 12 to 14 elementary schools. So 4,452 students in total with the requirement for approximately then 220 teachers to serve their needs. And this has presented senior administration with the challenge of respecting the desired program choice of our families while ensuring that qualified teachers are available in all models and that we are operating in the most fiscally responsible manner possible. So to meet this challenge, we first considered a full reorganization of mainstream schools to allow for the allocation of permanent teachers to the virtual school teaching assignments that we needed to create. And in modeling out this approach, we recognized that doing so would require compromises from a program perspective. Doing so was cost prohibitive. And even in the event of doing that, we would still unlikely to result in our ability to secure enough staff in all program areas. Reorganizing our schools would also have run contrary to maintaining reasonable class sizes in our regular day school environment as part of our, uh, our attempts to respect our health and hygiene measures in schools. So most recently, and certainly recently means within the last couple of days, staff are examining an alternative approach by enabling synchronous remote learners to remain attached to their homeschool classroom and teacher and participate with their peers learning in person via live streaming of the instruction that's taking place in the classroom. This model would provide the advantage of allowing students to remain connected to the students and teachers whom they know and who know them best. It would also allow for a much more fluent movement of students between virtual and face-to-face -face participation as their presence would already be accounted for and included in the homeschool classroom complement. And in this new approach, remote learners who identify the desire to engage in asynchronous learning will be served through a different model that will be staffed via the virtual school. But should we adapt that the model that we're now pursuing, we believe that an improved opportunity uh, for this asynchronous learners to move more fluently back into in-person attendance would also be realized. Earlier today, we contacted all parents to let them know that it's imperative that we have clarity about the specific numbers who are electing remote attendance, and we communicated a firm end date of Friday August 28th at 9 a.m. to receive these program requests. We know that this seemed unexpected and a bit surprising to our families. We really need to be able to staff our schools for September in the coming days to ensure student placements as in both face-to-face -face and remote learning for September as requested. 
firm numbers are essential for us to do that work. We also indicated in today's communication that the movement between models could be less fluent and less readily available given the circumstances that I've described throughout this presentation. The new model that we are devoting our attention to at this point will provide greater flexibility in this regard and will align more closely with the regular intervals for moving between programs that we first outlined in the school reopening guide. Our task in the coming days is to confirm the number of remote learners overall and then to confirm the number of students within this subset who require asynchronous remote program. And this will help us to determine the length and timing of intervals for students to request movement from one program to the other. We certainly desire to provide the utmost flexibility to our parents and our current work has as a key, this is a key driver, but within the realities of our ability to staff all models and remain fiscally responsible in doing so. So in light of what some parents have shared with us this afternoon, it's apparent to us that this was not clear in our communication. It was not our intention to suggest that there would be no opportunity for students to move from one model to the other, or that we weren't committed to making every attempt to provide this flexibility. So we hope that this relieves any doubts or uncertainties that may have arisen as a result of today's communication. And in closing, I just want to say that we will continue to work diligently and are continuing to work diligently to plan for and to achieve the best possible outcomes and opportunities for our students in light of the evolving available information and, of course, in light of the implications that this information brings to light to our planning process. We appreciate everyone's patience as we develop the best plan we can in these challenging circumstances. And so, Mr. Chair, that concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions or provide any clarifications to members of the board. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Rutters. I would now open the floor to questions from uh, you, the trustees. Mr. Chair, you have a question from Trustee Swan. Go ahead, Trustee Swan. So uh, it, it's clarification. So the letter that went out said that your selected delivery model may be in place for the duration of the school year and moving from one model to another will be on dependent on available space within the de desired program, um, which was contrary to the ministry direction of July 30th that said um, latitude to change uh, the decision of programming throughout the year would be available. So now this new model where you're proposing is working within their own classroom is, is going to um, allow children to move back and forth, perhaps still at, and I guess my question is, will it be at select times or is this allowing this now versus contrary to what the letter said today? Um, through you, Chair, if I could answer that question. So, yes, okay, so thank you. So, it's our desire for students to be able to move back and forth between the two programs. It's always been our desire for that to happen. The realities of the prior model that we've been working on made it evident to us that it would be very difficult to uh, have enough pupil places in either uh, program offering in the virtual school or in the um, mainstream school with our current complement of staff and the availability of additional staff we might be able to hire a from an affordability perspective but b also from an affordable workplace pers uh, workforce perspective in terms of the number of available uh, teachers who are not already uh, permanent so uh, we recognize that as a driver we really did want to examine a different model and that has been the focus of our work for the last 24 to 48 hours we however had not until probably late today felt with some level of assurance that we would be able to move forward with this new model we needed to provide our families with an, an absolute end date by which we received information about 
uh, their students' choice. And we also were aware that it would be unfair to imply that there was no risk of a longer intervals or potentially uh, difficulty with moving from one version to the other. So I, I can say that we are much closer to adopting the model, uh, the new model I've described tonight, and that within that model, uh, we are very confident that the opportunity for movement will be more assured because students will have a secure place that is available to them within their home school. What I can say, any decision about the movement and the, the frequency of movement also needs to take into consideration the contact tracing requirements uh, that we would be subject to uh, to discuss and have approved by our local health unit uh, in light of what may or may not be happening with regards to um, to health concerns at a given time. Thank you very Just much. A secondary to that. Yes, I, I'm just still not clear. So we aren't guaranteeing with this new model that let's say a high school student couldn't go back to school at the end of the quadmester. Uh, for you, Chair, uh, we're, we're quite confident that with this new model, we are far better placed to ensure that. And uh, I think the only barrier to that might be if we had a significant number of new registrants move into a particular school zone or area that would um, cause us to uh, look at course availability in terms of the number of people places available within uh, class maximums. Uh, but we would encounter those issues uh, uh, from time to time in any year and we would need to address those through an appropriate staffing allocation. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, through you, Chair, um, my question for uh, Superintendent Ruthers is when now, based on the letter that um, everyone received today, or at least all of our parents, um, when will parents be receiving a more assurance? Now we're asking parents to confirm by Friday their choice, but the parents that had confirmed their choice are now afraid with their choice because they may not be able to change their child's or their 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 child's selection. So we're now creating more fear. When can we? Like, I know nothing's 100%, but with school still being planned for a start of September 4th, um, parents sort of want to know what is going to occur and what timeline should they expect new or updated information to be released. So through you, Chair. Um, certainly, I understand and have great sympathy for people needing to know what it looks like for their children, and 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 that's certainly something that we we are intent upon providing. Uh, we've asked that that survey data. So we had provided the end of the the initial survey was August twentieth. We provided parents with the latitude since August 20th and have been posting on our social media pages the opportunity for them to reflect and if they wish to change their selection between the 20th and a, and a certain end point that they could. So we are simply establishing the end point for that opportunity. Um, and I understand that our communications, given the limitations we, we saw with our prior model, have created some concerns among our parents about what now, questions about now what am I locked into? I was hoping and I do hope that what I've shared tonight will help provide some reassurance that the new model we are pursuing uh, will in fact build back in the level of flexibility that we had spoke about um, in the original reopening guide. Um, so we will take the data effective at 9 o'clock Friday morning. We will then um, be sending out a subsequent um, opportunity and in fact a requirement of PPM 164 is that we then clarify with those folks who have chosen synchronous, chosen online learning or synchronous, synchronous learning online that we then determine from that group how many are unable for particular special circumstances or potentially for access to connectivity that we will not be able to mitigate for them um, if they are wanting to study asynchronously. And so we will identify those students 
um, and we will be providing a separate program option for those students who are not studying synchronously um, and and move forward with uh, planning specifically for the individual needs of those students who need an asynchronous program. So that work will be ongoing throughout um, next week, but we certainly would hope that before um, before September 1st that we would be in a position to communicate to our families their placement, uh, hopefully through the synchronous program uh, in, in their home school classroom um, and then uh, working through the individualized needs of people who've requested an asynchronous program. I hope that helps answer your question. Um, through you, Chair, I have a secondary. Go ahead, Trustee. Um, through you, Chair, if parents select by Friday the online synchronous learning and based on Tuesday's deliverables that we will not be able to allow them to come back into the classroom, are then they by Friday locked in for the one year online? So through you, Chair, I, I'm, cons I think what you're asking, just if I can clarify this, the response that parents give my 9 a.m. on Friday morning, you're requesting your clarification on whether that locks them in for the entire year to online. Is that correct? If, that's correct. If we cannot, because right now, as as you had stated, that we're still reviewing to hopefully be able to go back to what we had originally said at, um, at the last meeting. Now, if we cannot and they can't go back and forth based on the message they received today if the choice they make by friday morning then yes are they then locked in so if we can adopt the new model that i've described here tonight then we do not believe that anybody will be locked in per se to the selection for the duration of the school year. In fact, we, we believe that we will have the greatest degree of flexibility as compared to what we uh, have been working on prior to the last couple of days. Um, if we are not able to move forward with the new plan, it would still be our commitment that we would try to establish intervals for students to move from one program to the other. However, the distance between those opportunities would be significantly longer because we believe that it would cause us to have to actually move staff from the virtual program back into the mainstream school simultaneously with moving the students who've requested a return to mainstream school. So it's a much more involved and complicated process when we would essentially be staffed very, very tightly in both uh, virtual and mainstream in our prior model. And that was one of the motivations for our trying to move forward with an adapted model that I have spoken about tonight so that we could maintain the level of flexibility um, that we had initially um, uh, indicated to parents would be available. Thank you. Vice Chair McPherson, you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, I have a question about French immersion. Um, I realize that we're going to deliver a standard program in our classrooms. However, I have had several parents express concerns about the ability to deliver it in online learning. And what I need to know is, I uh, guess I'd like to have some assurances, but at least an explanation. Through you, Chair. So in the prior model that we've been pursuing, uh, where I talked about the uh, significant number of students and significant number of teachers um, that would be required to staff the virtual school, uh, we recognized that we would have to reorganize our elementary or our schools, our, our mainstream schools, and reallocate some staff to virtual. And within that, the constraint that we see would be difficulty in securing enough uh, French qualified teachers to fulfill the need from a programming perspective in French immersion in both the mainstream school and in the virtual school. And of course, the difficulty of serving French language programming, in particular the immersion uh, program, 
uh, not only here in the Upper Canada Board, but across the province has really been related to the availability of qualified French teachers. And so, um, again, that was one of our reasons, one of the list of reasons where we over the last few days have really felt the necessity to engage in an alternate plan because it would allow us to attach uh, a significant number of our virtual students back to their mainstream school where we already have an established staff complement to support our French immersion programming. So to answer your question, our prior model, we had significant concerns about our ability to serve French immersion in an, a remote learning uh, selection. Uh, we feel that with the program that we're attempting to move forward with now, uh, that that will be less of a concern. I will now move to uh, Trustee Schooner. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair. Um, forgive me if you've already um, explained this, but just for my own clarification, in the synchronous uh, circumstance, in a, an elementary classroom, let's say a, a grade four classroom, um, a child would be enrolled in his home school, uh, in his what would have been his regular home classroom with his peers and have the choice to either attend in person or through uh, streaming attend uh, virtually at home but still be part of that group is that correct that is our intention yes and we would certainly want to uh, you know to start with an established group that had selected face to face and an established group within that class that had elected for a, a, a remote learning experience but we do recognize the benefit of the fact that as potentially an illness or a change in circumstances in a family took place that we would be in a much better position for a movement into remote or into face-to-face -face, right. uh, for a student. That's correct. Okay. And, and if I may continue on my line of thinking, so, so what you're saying is that there could be movement between those two groups, depending on circumstances. Through you, Chair, yes, we believe that to be true. Okay, thank you. And, and if I may continue, so through you, Chair, so what is the um, advantage then for asynchronous learning or the difference between what we just discussed and asynchronous learning? So through you, Chair, we recognize, and I think the ministry through their PPM and the direction that they provided in PPM 164, we recognize that families may um, be in specific circumstances that make, uh, some families may be in specific circumstances that make engaging synchronously throughout the regular school day very difficult. So, for example, a parent could have a, a work schedule um, that would not allow them to be home with their student all day, and perhaps a caregiver is not uh, free to engage in the supportive work for synchronous learning that might be necessary, particularly for young children. That would be a reason that a parent might apply for an exemption uh, from synchronous learning, and the program we would be offering in lieu of synchronous learning would be asynchronous, so there would be flexibility for that family in terms of when and how they sit down to support their child in learning. And that asynchronous program could be an online version if the family has the connectivity um, to manage, um, to engage in that manner. It could be uh, an, uh, a non-digital route or non-digital program, uh, again, in light of the student's individual needs and in light of the family's ability to engage uh, using any kind of digital uh, sources. I get it. Thank you very much for that clarification. Trustee Swan. Hi, I'm just going to bounce off uh, Trustee Schooler because my questions were very similar. Um, so we have this grade four classroom with this new adapted model that's being presented tonight. And let's say we have 25 students, but five of those students choose to learn online in some format. So why can't, but the class is at 25, so we're within the right size. Why can't we guarantee transitions from an online format 
at intervals like we agreed to at the last meeting. What is the issue there? So through you, Chair, um, just to clarify, we do believe that if we are able to adopt the model that we have turned our planning and attention to over the last couple of days, if we are able to adopt that model, we do feel that there will be opportunity for a much more seamless uh, transition between home learning and learning in person at school. Just a secondary there. How are parents supposed to make a decision by Friday when we don't know if we're taking this new adapted model? Like I think we should present, I know you need to know numbers, but I think we need to use the 80% or attending in person. And, and is this number being presented to us as trustees so we can be part of this decision making process? Thank you. Inquest. Through you, Chair. Um, so we are bringing the information forward tonight, as my understanding, to provide some clarity about how the complexities of planning for the needs of students in both face-to-face -face and remote learning. Um, and we're uh, certainly working very diligently to try and move to uh, the model that will serve our students and families best. Uh, it's evolving daily from where we were talking about this yesterday afternoon. I would suggest that we are, uh, you know, probably 75% closer to being able to confirm our move forward with this new approach. Um, so certainly it would be our intention uh, to do so within the next day or two um, and potentially before 9 a.m. on Friday. However, we are also under incredibly tight timelines to have accurate numbers in order to plan effectively for all eventualities for all of the students. So we really, we really can't wait any longer to firm up those numbers. Trustee Parizier, you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, my question is regarding the French learning. Um, basically, based on the email stating um, that parents received today, indicating that some students may not be able to access uh, second language learning. Um, are we looking at, was the administration's focus that of the students that applied for high school credits, i.e. history and French or French class, or is it the 50% students, like the students in elementary school receiving sort of a half day French, half day English? what was you know it wasn't clear in the letter that parents received so the concern came from every direction to trustees as to what exactly did that mean uh, through you chair so uh staffing any french program in the virtual world even with our ability with the number of students we had enrolled even with our ability to reorganize schools and reallocate mainstream staff to the virtual school, in both the, pro the elementary and secondary panel, we felt we would be uh, in in grave, uh, gravely difficult circumstances to support French language programming in either uh, ful fulsomely in either panel. Uh, we have to understand too, folks, that uh, we're working against the clock. We have to train. Uh, we need to train the staff. And we need to uh, train employees. The numbers we have are the numbers that we have. Are there any further questions? I, I have a question, John, or John McRae. Go ahead, Trustee McRae. Thank you. I wondered if the province differentiates on how they fund um, the different um, types of learners. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, may I suggest that either our director or perhaps Superintendent Hobbs might have a uh, have a um, uh, an answer to that question? Mr. Chair, through you, I'll begin and ask Mr. Hobbs to fill in any of the blanks that I may present here. Uh, the technical paper provides clarity that uh, there is different funding for elementary students. Uh, per student uh, compared to secondary students per student. And then there are certain uh, enhancements based on uh, 
programs. Uh, so, for example, there is a, uh, a supplement or uh, an additional amount of funding provided for children who take um, a French immersion as an example. And so that additional funding helps with the purchase of um, uh, resources, which are often at a higher cost than English language resources because of the smaller, um, a smaller uh, market for some of those materials. Uh, in our instructional settings. I'll I defer to Mr. Hobbs though if, I've, if I'm offline here or if he wishes to fill in any of the blanks. Uh, thank you uh, and through you Mr. Chair. Um, no, the director actually captures it quite accurately. I think uh, if there was a comment I would make, uh, as it stands right now, what appears to be occurring is that the Ministry of Education has basically uh, funded us to operate a normal business as usual school system through the grants for student needs uh, program and the technical paper that you saw in late June, early July. We walked you through a series of um, uh, budget or budget presentations that kind of described the structure for that. And uh, the director is quite correct is within that there are a variety of ways that the ministry, the ministry definitely provides per student and per uh, school foundation funding but all kinds of supplements uh, are addressed around our unique circumstances as a rural board, for example, and the specific needs of schools and students in the context that, that we face. As it pertains to COVID specifically, it would seem that incremental funding associated with uh, the COVID response, uh, specifically targeted towards the COVID response, is uh, handled through a series of, of other grants called PPFs, which are Frankly, uh, we're used to seeing those things uh, formerly known as EPOs delivered as sort of supplemental grants that we would normally apply to specific program priorities uh, falling out of government policy. Uh, in this particular case, these PPFs or these little uh, pockets of special purpose targeted funding are being used to supplement the, the COVID response. So what you're seeing now is the basically the moral of the story is original normal grant structure plus uh, a series of PPFs that are targeted towards specific areas in the COVID response, some of which I'll touch on uh, later tonight in my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could I just a small supplement? Is that so? Last we've heard they have not differentiated between different types of online versus in-person learners. That's what I'm hearing. Uh, through you again, Mr. Chair, um, with respect to PPFs, there are some uh, specific actually funding allocations that have been targeted specifically, and I'll touch on those uh, later this evening, uh, specifically designed to support remote learning. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think there are some uh, additional measures within the, uh, the GSN that would provide some assistance to remote learning. I think the challenge that, as uh, Superintendent Rudders indicated, is that the sheer scale of uh, what we're uh, proposing to offer uh, for online learning is uh, really quite uh, extraordinary and unlike something that we would be prepared to normally. So we're really just trying to marshal all the resources that we can uh, to fit that particular avenue. But there is some uh, specifically targeted funding to support uh, remote learning for sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, I'm going to proceed. Me. I'm going to proceed uh, um, folks, uh, with uh, a question from a final question from uh, Trustee Swan, and I don't mean a final question. There'll be lots of opportunity for questions later, but after Trustee Swan Swan's question, we are going to move into update number two from Superintendent McNair. So uh, go ahead, uh, Trustee Swan. Thank you. My questions in regards to program. Programming. And if I understand this new adapted model that you've the superintendents and the board staff have been working on, so Johnny is going to is in his regular classroom and the teacher will be using technology to teach Johnny. And I'm just wondering why Johnny can't take phys ed or culinary arts or French with teacher in the classroom if he's assigned to his regular school and his regular classroom, which I understand this to be. Why can't we offer those students those courses to online students? Thank you. So through you, Chair, um, we are working through whether there are courses that we might not want to engage students uh, synchronously online into the mainstream classroom. Some of our courses, such as 
construction technology potentially, um, you know, uh, transportation uh, classes, uh, foods classes, they have a significant practical component and it would be, it doesn't lend itself as, uh, as I guess, easily or as reasonably to having students engage from a remote perspective. And what happens is, is that students don't feel necessarily as particularly interested or engaged in, in a case potentially where other students are having hands-on options with actual, um, you know, um, tasks on equipment, that sort of thing. And the online uh, synchronous learner who is listening in really doesn't have the benefit of that experience. So we're looking at how we might um, craft those experiences where possible and where other in other circumstances we may uh, be counseling students who've chosen to in the secondary level to engage in synchronous online with a classroom teacher and their peers who are also learning face to face that we really look at what courses we have that student enrolled in uh, during their time at home so that they have um, a more, I guess, engaging and reasonable uh, learning experience uh, dependent upon the nature of the course. Mr. Chair, I have a comment question. Go ahead, Trustee McDonald. Thank you. It is on this topic and I want to I want to have the opportunity to ask the question before we move on to the next one. My concern is that we we um, we've anticipated a model based on a 10% uh, number, but yet we always knew that there was a an opportunity or a potential that students would potentially or have the ability to opt in and opt out. And so if we had a model based on 10% um, and a virtual learning capacity, how are we ever going to be able to respond to the changing needs of students if they decided to opt out after week one, two, three, four, whatever it might be? Through you, Chair, um, and that, that's a, a fair question. I, I don't think any of us have ever been in the circumstance where we would anticipate uh, a 20 percent of our student population requesting to engage in an alternate program than our face-to-face -face program. Um, and uh, we were monitoring the survey from the time that it went up. The survey was created and went up within the same 24 hour time period that PPM 164 came down and gave us much more um, uh, stringent, I wouldn't, maybe perhaps that's not the right word, but much more detailed um, expectations around the variety of programs we needed to serve through that model um, to meet the needs of all students. And so that, um, that depth, that clarity uh, at the same time as the survey started, combined with uh, the, the movement of numbers throughout the, the time that that survey was, was over, had us having conversations as we got closer to the end of the survey um, and really questioning our ability to uh, manage this. Uh, there were a few things that we were looking at. We were looking at the survey results that really jumped for a secondary perspective, jumped from 600 to over 1200 in less than a 24 hour period. But in addition to that, the other component of this was really looking at the staff that we had who for legitimate and reasonable um, reasons were not able to return to face-to-face -face instructions for, for instruction, perhaps for medical reasons, perhaps for compassionate reasons due to the, their duties of care to family members who um, had uh, um, compromised immune systems. Um, and we were watching those numbers very carefully at the same time to determine what the balance would be between the number of students who are electing to study remotely and the number of staff that we might have at our disposal off, off the get-go 
uh, to accommodate those needs. And as we got closer to the end of the survey and as we modeled out the potential responses, it became increasingly clear to us as a team that uh, financially, even in consideration of those teachers that we had to, uh, to draw on as available permanent staff, um, and even the way we work our schools, uh, we would still be in a position where, from a workforce perspective, we would not be able to hire enough. And certainly from a, from a fiscally responsible decision-making perspective, we would not be in a position to hire them. Follow up, Mr. Chair, but that, that's my point, I guess. When we, when we think of this, you think of scalability, and we understand that parents and students had an opportunity that if things didn't look right or feel right when they went into the school setting, they had the ability to opt out. So if it didn't make sense based on the response, it probably didn't make sense from the beginning because how, how are we ever going to be able to do it? Running a parallel system, not having the, the number of resources available, human and financially, and, and then simply say that we because we got a 20% increase, we simply can't do it now. We, we could have started out with five and ended up at 25 within the first month. So, you know, why did we not have an alternative method designed prior to today? So through you, Chair, what I can say is that we did not receive clarity from the ministry through PPM 164 for the nature of the program that must be offered in the remote learning environment till the day the survey went out. So we went from potentially an assumption that it could look similar to what we were doing in the spring to a requirement that students be online for 225 minutes with direct contact with their teacher out of 300 day, minutes of instruction in a day. And that certainly was a game changer in terms of the volume of staff required to serve the synchronous learning uh, needs of students who may have uh, uh, opted for remote learning. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Rutters. Uh, I'm going to move to update number two. And before I do, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, uh, I wish to uh, advise that uh, I have a firm, I've had a longstanding firm commitment uh, this evening, which I've extended now till 7.30. So I will be leaving the meeting and um, Vice Chair McPherson will be uh, assuming the chair's role and uh, Trustee Parizier will be his acting uh, vice chair. So, uh, Trustee uh, Superintendent McNair, would you proceed with your presentation, please? Through you, Chair, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. It is my pleasure to take this opportunity to update the board about operational plans to support a staggered start in the Upper Canada District School Board for the reopening of schools commencing September 11th, 2020. Some key considerations for us this evening. The Ministry of Education confirmed that school boards are permitted to adopt a staggered start for the 2020-2021 school year. If such an approach contributes to our students' ability to learn new routines and to reinforce health and safety practices in our schools. Uh, as a senior administration team, we believe the most effective implementation of these requirements and practices would be achieved by allocating some additional time for our schools to welcome students in small clusters over several days. The revised plan for the start of the school, the new school year has several key components. We would be looking to revise our start date to September 11th with staggered entry of students. It's just to start classes one week later, commencing the 11th rather than Friday, September 4th, with small clusters of students attending the school over three successive days. We also believe that pre-engagement of virtual learners and finalizing school routines during the 4th to the se September 4th to September 10th is optimal. All school staff will be completing digital check-ins with students who selected remote learning. We will be refining enhanced health and safety routines for our students who will also be returning to the school site. In terms of preparing our digital platforms, our staff will need to establish an active digital footprint in D2L and Microsoft Teams and any other board supported platforms. 
so that our district is fully ready should we need to move to remote learning for all students at any time during the 2020-21 school year. Following on my colleague uh, Superintendent Rudder's presentation and the confirmation of attendance survey from parents and guardians, 20% or one out of five of our students are seeking remote learning for the upcoming school year. So having the opportunity to work on the digital platforms is critical for us. And lastly, school boards have received the provincial agenda and content material to be delivered to our staff on the upcoming PA day scheduled September 1st, September 2nd and September 3rd. And we believe that staff will be engaged for two full days in training and receiving professional learning that enhances educators knowledge and skills for the effective support of all students with you within UCDSB. This would leave us only one PA day to reinforce uh, health and safety practices and help support the stu student learning of new routines. As per the model in front of you on, on the screen, you will see that in elementary, we are proposing a staggered start uh, and we would be looking to cluster students by surname. So A to J, G, sorry, would start September 11th. We would then welcome those students to continue to join us September 14th and 15th. However, on September 14th, we'd bring in a second cluster of students with surnames H to P and then uh, and we would ask those students to continue to join us to September 15th. And then on um, uh, September 15th, we would bring in surnames Q to Z. I noticed the screen says R, it would be Q to Z. So therefore by September 15th, in essence, we would have all of our elementary students in the classroom. The secondary model we are proposing for a staggered start would be on September 11th, we would be inviting our grade nines to the school. They would stay with us uh, from, from the 11th on and, and they would have grade 10s join the building on September 14th. And then on September 15th, we would have grade 11s and 12 students join us in the building. And therefore in the secondary staggered start, we would have all of our students in the secondary buildings as of September 15th. So at this time, trustees, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have or provide further information for you if you wish. And I turn this back over to uh, either Chair McAllister or Vice Chair McPherson. Thank you, uh, Superintendent McNair. I'm going to turn the floor over to uh, Vice Chair McPherson. Right, thank you. Okay, any questions for Superintendent McNair on her presentation? I have one and I put it in the meeting chat. Okay, go ahead, Trustee Swan. Hi, through you, Chair. Uh, my question is, why are we bringing in, in the high school model, the grade nine back first instead of the, doing 12, 11, 10, nine? because I would think that their programs may be a lot more difficult and they may need more classroom time. So why are we starting with grade nines first in, instead of the higher grade? Through you, Vice Chair, uh, it, is, it is in our opinion that starting with a grade nine since high school is a very new learning experience for them. We feel the opportunity to get them accustomed to our school environment uh, the high school portion of the school environment. Yes, I certainly understand there are many seven to 12 schools in our board and they've already been in a certain maybe wing in a, in, within a school, but to engage them and uh, help with the orientation for our grade nine students, we think this is critical. In a normal year, we would have been doing um, some face-to-face -face orientation, offering that opportunity for our students uh, potentially this upcoming week. So um, we feel at this time it would be in our, it, it would be our, in the best interest to uh, orient orient our grade nines into our high school settings. A secondary on that one. I know some universities are going back and and they're doing their orientations online. So could we not re look at this plan? and do some orientation activities for the grade nines online and start with the grade 12s. Can this be workable? 
through you, Vice Chair. Um, it, absolutely, uh, we are. We have noted and um, and shared with our uh, high schools that they are welcome to do virtual online orientation um, opportunities for their grade nine students. And uh, through this, uh, our presentation and, and discussion with you tonight, uh, what you have in front of you is our proposal. But we are certainly um, open to your uh, suggestions or recommendations. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, this is, trustees. Whoops, sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I just wanted to ask. Um, I don't know how the other trustees feel about starting with grade 12 and do we need a motion to direct staff in regards to this or do the other trustees not not agree with my idea that we should start with grade 12 and do virtual orientation for the grade nines? So just want to know if I need a motion or something. Uh, as a follow up, may I, um, uh, Vice Chair McPherson, it was also uh, we consulted with our school principals. Uh, we have a, a, a group of school principals that sit on our operations council, and it was certainly on the advice of those school principals as well that they would um, welcome uh, the opportunity to engage our grade nines into the high school setting first. OK, it does address your concerns, Trustee Swan. No, because I think we as trustees should have a, a role in this decision. Uh, it's largely an administrative action. And this is information reports tonight. To uh, keep us in the loop, so to speak. That's just my spin on it, but. Uh, um, Thank you, and, and I so mean you, the loop, so to speak, is exactly what it is because apparently we aren't in it. Well, I won't disallow a motion, but uh, if you care to ma make a motion, I I will at least see if you get a seconder. But I think we're we're heading into an area that trustees, as a general rule, do not go. This has largely been an administrative exercise. OK, hearing nothing further. Uh, I, I'd, like Stewart, I'd like to put you, forward a motion that the grade 12 start first and we reverse the order and do um, a virtual orientation. OK. Uh, Do I have a second here? Hearing none, can we move on? OK, there has been no response. It I have. Thank you. OK, moving on to I'm Trustee Schooler. Second it. Seconded by who? McDonald. OK. OK, we have a motion on the floor. I'm typing it if Lisa needs it. OK, so. Do we. OK, I've got to go over to board doc. Just excuse me for a sec. OK, Tr Lisa, can we put that up on board docs? Uh, we're going to be patient here.
Okay. We have a motion that the proposed return to school in high schools start with grade 12s and a virtual orientation for grade nines at the start of the week. We have it moved by Swan, seconded by McDonald. I will ask you to cast your ballots online as soon as Lisa Workman gets it up on board docs. Okay, it's now up on board docs. I'd ask you to cast your ballots online. I'm in favor. I have technical difficulties with board docs tonight. Okay, I'm waiting for results. I don't have anything up uh, electronically, Bill. I'm opposed, Danaher, Trustee Danaher. Okay, Lisa uh, Workman will take note of that. She's our polling clerk, so to speak. Oh, any indication of a of a result yet? Nothing like dead airspace, eh? Mr. Chair, it's Stephen. I think we're just waiting to confirm. Uh, from uh, yes. take it back from Ms. Workman. Okay. Can can you hear me now? Yes, we can. That yes, motion can. has been defeated. Motion has been defeated. Okay. Correct, uh, Mr. Trustees. Chair. What was that again? Just confirming, Mr. Chair, that that is correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to Trustee Schooler's question. Uh, thank you. Through you, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, I have a question uh, for sure, but I must. Uh, um, uh, reflect some comments that have been uh, given to me by some of my constituents who are dismayed by the change in start date um, due to the fact that it has created hardship for them. Um, initially, upon hearing that there was a September 4th start date, they made arrangements uh, for things like child care and and personal work and um, a, a, a significant number of families who have both parents working are now inconvenienced uh, by this decision. Um, and so I'm wondering if there's, uh, first of all, um, unanimity ab amongst the trustees for the change in a date, start date. And uh, secondly, if there's uh, uh, any way that if the date is changed, that we can support those parents uh, who um, are having the difficulty to, to make those necessary arrangements uh, that involve either their personal work or their childcare. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, Superintendent McNair, do you have a response or? Uh, through you, Vice that, Chair. I, I, I'm not yes. sure if there was a question towards me or if, if uh, a trustee schooler's question was more to the fellow trustees. Okay, so let me summarize. You're asking if there's an appetite at the table to revert to the previous opening date. Have I heard it correctly? Yes, that's correct. And if that in, is in fact uh, the way that we go, uh, is there any way that we can offer support to those parents that have been inconvenienced uh, by the change in date? Vice Chair McPherson, if I could just add a comment as well, similar to my comment uh, in the previous discussion, um, we have had a consultation as well with our school principals and uh, this certainly works uh, in favor of our school staff as we feel we have uh, certainly lots of work to do as I had shared in terms of uh, preparing for the digital platforms and um, uh, ensuring the health and safety of our of our school sites. So uh, we do uh, in consultation with our school principals feel that uh, this would be beneficial for us as well. OK, thank you. Um, OK, again, do you wish to proceed with a motion? Yes or no? Hearing was, nothing. Was that comment or, directed towards me? Uh, yeah, yes, please. Uh, sorry, I trustee schooler. Um, my, my fault. No, sorry. Um, I, I don't know if I'm interested in putting a motion on the table. I guess I might be interested in hearing if any of my fellow trustees have had similar concerns expressed to them amongst uh, their constituents. OK, I'll just comment as a trustee, not necessarily as sitting chair right now. Uh, my comments and I'm getting are all over the map. Uh, some people felt that even September 11 is too much too soon. Uh, other parents are saying should have gone with the fourth. Uh, it's one of those cases where my constituents have and it perhaps reflects the fact that we've got poor internet service in our area and things like that. But uh, uh, my comments that I've been getting uh, have been even as far as the 1st of October, some people are saying we should give give more time to make sure we do it right. But that's just my comments as a trustee. Any further comments from the floor? Through you, Chair, it's Trustee Swan. Go ahead. Go ahead, I Trustee concur, Swan. I, I concur with you that that's mostly what I've been hearing. I do know there are some parents that will be scrambling with changing the data at this late, and I really empathize. But also, if we don't do this right or as best we can for health and safety reasons of staff and students with this pandemic, it, it could impact them far greater later. So I say err on the side of the caution and do the, the scattered start. Um, I think it's the safest route to go and I think most of the parents that have communicated with me um, have agreed with that. And the firm with the comments or questions from the floor for Superintendent McNair. Hearing none, thank you. And we'll move on to item 5.03. Update number three, funding sources to respond to projected COVID-19 expenses and turn it over to Executive Superintendent of Business Services, Jeremy Hobbs. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And again, it's uh, my pleasure to bring uh, you an update, a financial update that feels almost nearly hot on the heels of the uh, budget meeting in the middle of July. But to also, I think the purpose here is to uh, bring trustees up to speed on current and ongoing efforts of staff to identify funding sources that would assist uh, the board and staff in their response to COVID-19 as we go into 2021 as well as a little bit on expenditures and preparations to date from a financial perspective. So just by way of a bit of background, as you recall, as far back as June 2020, 
uh, through our financial conversations, we recognized the need to begin to identify funding sources that could be applied to supporting the COVID-19 response uh, in 2021. You recall at the time we uh, commented on the extreme uncertainty and the need to sort of keep some funds in reserve uh, so that we could allow the situation to evolve uh, and then uh, apply the funds in a way that best suits the context we are facing. Uh, and no surprise that situation continues to evolve on a daily, day to day or even hour to hour basis in some cases. Uh, in the 2020-21 budget process, the finance team identified between 900,000 and $4.7 million in current and potential unallocated revenue that could be eventually applied to the COVID-19 responses. Since that time, uh, in the, uh, there's been an August 4th B11 memo from the Ministry of Education uh, that provided an, an additional $1.3 million to our school board to date. Uh, so there's, there's, I think, more to come in some of those categories, which I'll unpack a bit later. But it will be additional funding uh, related to COVID-19 that's earmarked for a variety of purposes. Uh, on August 14th, you'll recall that uh, the UCDSB received a ministry memo that outlined additional guidance and funding for school reopening. Uh, and that really focused on, uh, I think to use the words of the Minister of Education, that they were unlocking an opportunity for us to tap into uh, accumulated surplus or reserves that we might have to support uh, the ongoing COVID response. And they also included some additional uh, funding as well for ventilation and um, to the trustees point earlier, uh, remote learning as well. Uh, in addition to these measures, we're still working on continuing to uh, confirm anticipated sources of funding. And as I'll just mention tonight, uh, these sources of funding continue to roll in uh, even since this, uh, this, was, this report was actually drafted. So again, changing hour to hour. So uh, just to recapitulate for you, the major sources, uh, current and potential sources of revenue identified to date, if you uh, take a look at the um, the, if you have, have an opportunity to look at the report, there's a table one in there that is a summary of the major source of revenue that could be applied to the COVID-19 response subject to the prevailing constraints. The first one uh, in row one, there's approximately $2.97 million in uncommitted funding that was associated with the ratification of collective agreements for OSSTF, ETFO, uh, OSSTF education workers and CUPE. So you'll recall back during the budget process, uh, we talked about uh, grants for student needs and one of the subcategories called the supports for students fund. And this is a supplementary body of funding that was available to boards as part of the uh, a result of the central central sort of settlement of uh, the central portion of collective agreements with these unions. Um, and this to date remains largely unallocated for the Upper Canada District School Board. Uh, amounting to $2.968 million. And that actually comes with a variety of constraints. Specifically, uh, much of it is to be targeted towards spe the special education supports. But in theory, uh, the idea here is that if we can find qualifying expenditures that are related to COVID-19 and that meet the constraints that are associated with those additional funding amounts, we could apply that to support uh, the, the COVID-19 response. The second row uh, that I'll touch on is $4.7 million and that you'll be uh, familiar with just going back to our budget process of this year where we identified that contingency reserve, if you will, for lack of a better term of between 900,000 and $4.7 million in uncommitted revenue that we could potentially apply. I think the important thing to recognize with this and to remind trustees is that that range is really about uh, the 900,000 at the low end represents what we knew at that time we could access with a high degree of certainty. It was either in hand or 99% uh, certainty. The 4.8 or $4.7 million is really more of a maximum and uh, it's, it's really contingent on a couple of sources of revenue that have yet to materialize uh, with certainty. And so as you'll recall, one of those sources of revenue, uh, the special incidents portion or SIP funding, uh, there's about two of that $4.7 million, $2.4 million is SIP funding that we have not yet uh, had confirmed for us yet. So it's something that we think it's likely, but uh, we haven't yet gotten confirmation of that. And so we would be reluctant to necessarily commit to a large expenditure of that funding without further confirmation that that is in fact going to be realized. And then, and finally in row three of table one, 
This refers to the additional funding that was announced by the Ontario Ministry of Education in their August 4th, 2020 B11 memo. And this provided a significant additional funding across a range of approximately 16 categories. I think it was actually 13 or 14 categories in the August 4th memo and then another couple of categories that were added in subsequently in the August 14th memo. Uh, so again, uh, of these 16 categories, these also include, these include funding for technology, mental health, uh, teacher staffing, administration staffing, custodial staffing, supports for ventilation, personal protective equipment, uh, remote uh, learning. Uh, not all of those categories have been, the, the UCDSB share uh, has not been announced for all of those categories. So of the seven categories for which we do know the UCDSB share, uh, that all comprises approximately $1.8 million. So that's something that we could, again, uh, we, ha we have to actually uh, spend that money according to the uh, conditions with which it flowed, but there's $1.8 million there uh, that we can use against qualifying expenditures related to the COVID-19 response. And we do fully expect further funding to come uh, in some of those categories. And as recently as yesterday, in fact, uh, I think there was an initial determination of the UCDSB of share of funds in a couple of other categories. So. Uh, in terms of ventilation or support for ventilation, approximately $860,000 in addition to that amount has come in in the category of ventilation. And an additional $623,000 has been earmarked for the UCDSB in the area of student transportation. Uh, and then, of course, uh, as of today, uh, the, or as of yesterday, you'll recall that the federal government announced $2 billion uh, to support provincial back to school initiatives and that has very quickly been uh, rolling out uh, that's very been been very quickly rolling out uh, both our province has determined its share they've determined their policy priorities and also what our individual shares as boards are of that and pleased to announce that uh, we've got it looks like nine hundred and eleven thousand dollars for additional teaching staff 1.2 million dollars for uh what is quote unquote emerging issues related to COVID response, an incremental $434,720 for transportation, another $188,000 for remote learning, and another $166,000 for special education and mental health. So that is incremental uh, to what I have in this report. And I apologize that uh, I just uh, didn't get that information in time uh, before this report went to press, so to speak. Uh, but certainly we'd be happy to bring that back to trustees uh, and continue to incorporate that into our updates as the situation evolves. Uh, in addition, of course, on August 14th, the Ministry of Education announced measures that would permit boards to access their accumulated surpluses available for compliance, colloquially known as reserves, to a greater extent than previously allowed. So as you will recall, uh, our board is, uh, like all boards, is permitted to run, uh, to overspend their in-year operating revenue by up to 1% normally, uh, and that would amount to about $3.5 million for our board. We could essentially run a $3.5 million deficit and technically still uh, remain in compliance provided we had the reserves to cover it. Uh, this new unlocking action that occurred on August 14th would allow us to spend into deficit up to 2%. So provided we have the reserves to cover it, which we do, and uh, that would allow us to overspend our budget by uh, about six and a half million dollars. And, uh, you know, this again, this six and a half million dollars of deficit that we could incur by drawing down on our reserves would, would, uh, could be applied towards the COVID response as well, of course. So uh, again, uh, if I were to sum up all of these uh, measures, uh, you know, um, that's another $6.8 million in, in addition. And then uh, you'll recall back on uh, June 17th, 2020, just to give you a sense of where our reserves lie uh, through financial forecast number three, which is the most recent formal forecast that we have of our reserves uh, at year end or August 31st, 2020, we're anticipating having accumulated a surplus available for compliance of $10.8 million. So obviously, if we're allowed to run a 2% deficit, which is around $6.8 million, uh, we, ha we do have enough in reserve to balance that deficit. And so it's a possibility. 
keeping in mind, uh, you know, staff are currently now starting to work on the actual financial results for year end of 1920, and that will bring with it certainty about what the actual reserve amounts are that we have to work with. But we feel fairly confident that that would more than cover the 2% that uh, we could overspend if we needed to. Uh, just one thing I think that's important to note about that $10.8 million surplus uh, available for compliance. Uh, the, the way it's broken out is approximately $2, two million of that $10.8 million is associated with a general operating surplus and a further $8.8 .8 million of that $10.8 million is what we call internally appropriated funds. And those are sort of funds that the board has historically sequestered uh, to protect for, for specific purposes or entities. So, you know, when school, schools, but school budgets experience surpluses, uh, those roll up to the board, the board uh, budget, and those are internally appropriated to protect those school budgets, which could be just a result of under expenditure on occasional teachers or so on. Uh, as you may recall from one of my previous presentations, most school budgets were in a fairly unanticipated sur surplus uh, position this year, just by virtue of how quickly the school year got truncated due to COVID. So we were essentially missing uh, three or four months of spending on things like field trips and uh, occasional staff and so on. So that rolled up into that $8.8 .8 million. In addition, that $8.8 .8 million uh, includes the accumulated surpluses or reserves for entities like the Champions for Kids Foundation and Upper Canada Leger Centre. Uh, and as you recall, you may recall from previous presentations on UCLC, uh, that carrying a reserve has been part of the mechanism by which they have insulated themselves financially from the pain of international students uh, rapidly withdrawing from Canada due to the COVID response as well. So I just wanted you to have an understanding of where that, a little bit of an understanding where those surpluses come from and the difference between the general operating surplus and the $8.8 .8 million, which is internally appropriated. Together, they represent $10.8 .8 million. And again, uh, up to the 2% of our operating revenue, we could spend about $6.8 million of that. So we would be definitely dipping into uh, some of those internally appropriated funds. Uh, so um, again, uh, for moving on to the next bullet, uh, again, we have enough based on the anticipated uh, surplus available for compliance at year end of $10.8 million to cover a 2% uh, deficit spending. Uh, just noting again that they would uh, actually have the effect of depleting some of that internally appropriated surplus. Uh, in addition, just with regard to uh, expenditures, uh, the UCDSB is prepared with material and supplies. Um, uh, where we have been working to prepare with material and supplies for the start of the 2021 school year for some time. So uh, I think to, to the credit of uh, Brad Notman, our manager of purchasing, he very quickly identified along with the rest of the team at, at the start of July that we weren't sure what the um, uh, po opening posture would be like in September, but we knew we would need things like uh, personal protective equipment or PPE, signage, barriers, uh, you know, um, cleaning supplies and so on. And so he's been working on uh, using the available financial capacity into the 2019-20 school year uh, to actually stockpile that in anticipation of supply chain issues, which other boards I think are starting to feel a little bit. So we've actually committed about $1.8 million in the current fiscal year, 1920, uh, on, on items uh, like cleaning supplies, PPE, uh, large quantity of cloth masks in child and adult sizes for kids who can't, uh, who, or who forget or can't bring their own to school, uh, all kinds of uh, medical masks for staff and so on. Uh, we have the list, it's just too exhaustive to go through here. Uh, those items are already being delivered to schools uh, and will largely be expensed in the 2019-20 school year. And we expect that, that the supply we've ordered to date will get us through uh, a good chunk of October, if not all of October, and then we're, we're going to have to re replenish our supply. So really trying to work on making sure that we have at least a supply that'll do us for 90 days out in case we bump into any, any further supply chain issues. So that amount of $1.8 million spent to date in 2019-20 doesn't include further significant expenditures on computer purchases. And as you heard from, I think I mentioned, I may have mentioned last week that we've uh, purchased about 1,400 new computers um, that we're preparing to roll out for, for people who need them for distance ed. Continuing to go on with internet and Wi-Fi upgrades, 
uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, main, doesn't include expenditures that were are already underway or planned for maintenance on school, heating, ventilation, and and air conditioning systems. Uh, and these are these are all things that are going to assist with the COVID response, but they're oftentimes they're things that uh, are beneficial whether or not we had a COVID response. So we're really just taking the time to make sure all those things uh, are up and running without necessarily depleting the funds that we would need for things that are specifically and solely related to a COVID response. And then finally, as you've heard this evening from my colleagues, uh, staff are continuing to digest both direction from the Ministry of Education and the data that represents the interests and concerns of parents and staff, and we're really developing the recommended response to school startup and beyond. So if I was to actually summarize, I think that, uh, you know, if you look at table one, again, we've identified an upside of approximately $9.5 million that we have potentially to allocate if we were to spend uh, completely our entire uh, uh, deficit capacity of 2%, that would add another approximate $6.8 million to that. And as I mentioned uh, in just my sidebar with regard to the additional funds that have come in earmarked for ventilation, transportation, uh, some additional teaching staff and so on through the, both the ministry's uh, further clarification of their allocations, as well as uh, the um, federal government's additional allocation that represents another $4.4 million. So the board is, I think, is very well positioned. Uh, it sounds like a very big number, over $20 million in potential funding to respond, and we are certainly grateful to uh, the various levels of, gr of government that have and continue to uh, sort of itemize uh, these funding sources. And I think we're really in a position, uh, you know, uh, I think the challenge that we're grappling with, all of us are grappling with, is the sheer scale of what we're trying to pull off. And I think that, uh, you know, there's some challenges remaining in finding a model that's affordable and sustainable given the risk that we and uncertainty we face ahead of us. But we are certainly well positioned, I think, to be able to uh, financially support uh, a model that's going to work for kids. Thank you very much. OK, opening the floor to questions. Or comments. Mr. Chair, John McRae. Uh, yes, go ahead, John. Thank you. Um, I want to start by commending the the um, what the uh, superintendents have done in regard to the remote learning and uh, especially going for an August 31st deadline. Um, I want to say that I think the staggered learning has some benefits for regard to busing and to getting um, staff oriented, but this I. I have, and in regard to this last presentation, I think you um, trustees know how I feel about using that reserve to to make school safe, and um, I I want to be confident that that the schools will be safe in regard to when everyone, all of them having windows at work, all of them having any ventilation or in class filters. So I guess what I'm saying, to sum up, is that. I would like to see if, as I would hope, the reserves are used, they will be used for capital expenditures to make sure the schools in the, in the so our are, are, are senior leaders, so our, um, all the superintendents through on through up to Steve can say, and I can say, that we made the schools as safe as we could, and, and if something happens, well, we, we looked after our end. Thanks, Mr. Chair, sorry for taking so long. Okay, not a problem. Through you, okay. Chair, I just sent a um, motion to Lisa. In yeah, regards I'm taking it trustee, out here. No, in regards to what yeah, trustee uh, was, um, John McRae just said, in regards to ventilation in our schools. Okay, then there's more than one motion. I've got one from you. I About sent three 48 motions. hours. From three, OK, another one just popped up here. I'm multi screening here, so please apologize. Uh, my apologies. No, I'm, and I'm running out I can't of pull up board bandwidth. Things. But it Can was in regards to while we're getting the motions. Schools. Yeah, I'm just trying to get it here. 
Okay. So we have three motions from Trustee Swan. The first motion. Okay, just that the director prioritize ventilation improvements over any unassigned capital school renew projects from the 2019-2020 plan and bring a report as soon as possible. I assume that is moved by Trustee Swan. Um, could you That's explain correct. the Mike, rationale just, of the motion? The rationale of the motion is that we need ventilation in many of our schools and increased ventilation. So I think this should be a priority spending and our board should actually commit to this priority spending. I know we've heard it, but by putting forward a motion, we're providing direction to commit to it. And I think that's important. Thank you. OK, do we have a seconder for that motion? All seconded. Hearing. Sure. All seconded. John Trustee McCray. McCray. Yeah. Trustee, Trustee McCray. OK, moved by Trustee Swan, seconded by Trustee McCray that the director prioritize ventilation improvements over any unassigned capital school renewal projects from the 2019 2020 plan and bring a report to the board, I assume, as soon as possible. Yes, sir. I thought it said that. That's correct. Anyone care to speak to the motion? Hearing none, we shall ask you to cast your ballots online Question through via the chair. board docs. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Trustee Jacobs. Go ahead. The, the question I have is yes. yeah. when it comes to prioritizing uh, ventilation improvements, is that just um, noting which ones could be improved or is that getting people to physically improve the ventilation to the chair? Uh, Trustee Swan, you care to direct that, answer that? Well, through you, Chair, I, I was saying improve the ventilation. I mean, for classes that don't have windows, for example, we could put HEPA filters in them. At least it's a start. But to anything to increase the ventilation in our classrooms is increasing the safety of our students from what we've been told by the health unit. Thank you. If okay. follow question, do we have any? Go ahead. Do we have anything from the health ministry or even the education ministry on the minimum of ventilation requirements for the pandemic response? Through the chair. Yeah, uh, just uh, Director Sleva, do you have a response for that? Mr. Chair, I do. I think it was. A I know that Superintendent Hobbs. Yes. I know that Superintendent Hobbs has been. Uh, in touch, Mr. Chair, with the health unit um, as part of a, uh, a wider dialogue around the preparation of schools. And I know that the, the topic of air, uh, ventilation and flow has been part of that discussion. I think it would be helpful for the board to hear from Superintendent Hobbs with regards to that and advice he may have given his years of working with capital improvements, including uh, how we um, uh, uh, establish and uh, maintain and support our HVAC system. So I'll turn it over to, to Executive Superintendent Hobbs for his comment, Mr. Chair, uh, if you may. Uh, thanks, Director Sliwa. Okay, through, thank you. through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think, you know, last week, I think at our meeting, I dealt with this topic fairly exhaustively in terms of the nature of the improvements that we are already in the process of applying uh, when I say improvements, I really refer to, uh, you know, as I mentioned at that time, uh, filtration and airflow are our two primary concerns. Looking at number one is are our existing HVAC systems functioned, functioning as designed? 
uh, with both respect to optimizing the filter, the filtration for each individual HVAC system, uh, taking measures to actually improve airflow. And I would actually distinguish between rapidly circulating air in a classroom, which is something that you don't necessarily desire because it would have a tendency to spread the droplets that might contain uh, COVID. Uh, what I really refer to is the natural process by which we bring in uh, fresh air from the outside world, recirculate air sometimes within the schools, and then exhaust uh, air from the outside into the outside world as well. So one of the things that, as you recall from our meeting last week that we're doing is looking at the balance of that recirculation so that we're actually recirculating less air in the schools, bringing more fresh air into the schools. And as the health unit mentioned, uh, you know, the idea here is to dilute the air in the school with fresh air, not necessarily move uh, or like move the air faster through in the school because that creates its own set of problems. So uh, as I mentioned again at our meeting last week, that's there's a whole series of measures that we undertook around relative humidity, monitoring uh, CO2 levels to actually satisfy ourselves that the recirculation is happening as designed. Uh, looking at windows and in fact as recently as this morning my team has given me a quote on portable help HEPA filters for areas that uh, are not going to be uh, where we don't see satisfactory uh, airflow or not airflow but air uh, circulation in the schools and quite frankly that will likely eat up most of what the the ministry's allocation is for uh, ventilation which is my understanding of the intent with regard to uh, actual uh, capital improvements like, um, uh, you know, uh, putting in windows where there aren't windows and uh, wholesale rip and replace of HVAC systems there, I think are a couple of things that would give us pause. Uh, first of all, uh, we have lots of experience doing these kinds of projects, but they typically uh, take place over a couple of years where we have to bring in consulting engineers and mechanical engineers to look at the existing uh, system in a school uh, do a fairly extensive design work, uh, tender the project, and then bring in uh, contractors to do that body of work. So that is something that would typically occur over the course of the fall, and then uh, the actual construction work would occur in the following summer. And it's really not work, uh, work of that magnitude in schools is not conducive to being done when students are also in schools. So I think that that is something that uh, is a concern for us, as well as I think the magnitude of the uh, the actual financial impact uh, really actually quite honestly dwarfs the even the if we were to spend our total uh, surplus available for compliance uh, that that might do one high school. So I think the challenge for us right now is that, you know, with regard to the capital that we have, we can certainly, I think, note the appetite for uh, um, sort of starting to plan more projects that are going to touch us known spots where we're not satisfied with the circulation. So that's something we can definitely do. Very difficult to put in motion, if not impossible to put in motion in the short term. Uh, but certainly, I think that if there's an appetite for us to talk, speak again about the measures that we're putting in place uh, in schools and particularly how we're spending the money that the ministry has allocated towards ventilation, we'd be ha certainly happy to do that. OK, thank you. Any further comments from the table or questions? Hearing none, I will ask you to cast do, your ballots online. I have another question or yes, go ahead, Trustee McCray. Uh, it wasn't me. It's McDonald. It's McDonald. Oh, McDonald. Sorry, you both sound alike over my headphones. My apologies. Go ahead, Dave, Trustee McDonald. Thank you. I, my question is for for Su Superintendent Hobbs. When he um, when he has the information here in front of us, um, we we see that there's the, the table shows about nine and a half million dollars um, to to deal with with some of uh, the potential expenses. Based on that, we would be potentially within our 2%. What we heard in in, uh, in report one or update one uh, was if, if the model that we had originally proposed went forward, there's a potential for 200 teachers being required. Has that been costed and do we have any, any data to, to, to show 
what the implication for that would be? Okay, Superintendent Hobbs, do you have a response? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, yes, uh, my team did actually do a preliminary costing. So they looked at the cost of very similar to how they would any other staff costing, looking at uh, the prevailing benchmark rates for uh, hiring teaching staff. And, uh, you know, at 200 staff, I believe they estimated approximately $23 million with salaries and benefits. And I don't uh, believe that they accounted for any at replacement costs or absenteeism uh, or any further growth in that. But that was kind of a 20, 21 to $23 million was the, uh, the estimate. Okay, not losing a, a track of our direction here. Question? Just to sec, Just we have a, are you going to speak to the motion? We have a motion on the floor that has been moved and seconded. And if this pertains to the motion in front of us, please proceed. If it's a generic question for Superintendent Hobbs, could we wait until after the vote? Is it to the motion? Yes, it is. Superintendent okay, proceed Hobbs. proceed then. Thank you. This is a question through you, Chair, for Superintendent Hobbs. By us making a direction, can we still, um, what's the word? Can we still, um, you have other projects that you haven't set out money for. By us putting forward this motion, can this help direct your staff to provide more HEPA filters or whatever to places where we don't have time to change ventilation systems in schools. Thank you. Mr. Chair, may I have said, add something to it? It is John. Uh, just let, yeah, just let Superintendent Hobbs respond to that question first. Sorry, sorry Bill. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I'm I'm um, I'm struggling a little bit to to determine how to answer uh, a, um, a a question that I, I believe is uh, offered in the sincerest uh, intention to help us out. I think uh, you know to be to be completely candid with you, uh, it would not be my intention to uh, you know direct trustees as the, the nature of the the direction they would like to give staff. But, you know, I think my my feeling with my facility staff is we would like to have the freedom. We I think we've heard I should preface that by saying we've heard the priority from our board of trustees on making sure schools have proper ventilation. I think we've heard it from the Ministry of Education, certainly from our local health units. And, you know, I think that what we need to do is we have 84 different facilities and I'm loath to uh, impose, uh, you know, an expenditure of any type until we start um, looking at what's needed in each individual instance. Uh, so, you know, like I, the only, my only reservation would be being, uh, being constrained to apply funding uh, in a particular way or in a, in a particular amount and finding out it's not exactly what's needed. So, you know, I, I feel like I just want to reassure you that I've heard the emphasis that you have uh, made along with Trustee McRae. Uh, I will certainly reflect that to my staff uh, we are certainly prepared to be accountable at every school for the nature of the ventilation there and the measures that we are prepared and going to take at those schools, uh, including HEPA filters and any other measures that are ne that are needed uh, in the short or long term. So, uh, you know, generally speaking, I think that uh, what I'm looking for right now for my facility staff would be the flexibility to respond where and uh, how is needed at any individual school. Uh, recognizing full well the the emphasis that trustees have placed on uh, proper ventilation for our kids and stuff. Okay, Trustee McCray, you had a comment or a question? Yes, thank you, Bill. Um, I I think so. I think that yeah, the, the Jeremy's group needs needs latitude. I just think it's important to appreciate that um, if there is a, a class without a window, I know people that can come in in a short order and put it in if there's a window there already so if some of them don't work or they're the, when he mentioned outside air i think he was right on and and that there has to be i would want all the the classrooms 
to have access to outside air. If that's in place, well, yes, he's a, his professional staff can take it from there in my view, but I, I want it to be a capital expense and that's why I seconded this motion. Thank you. Okay, any further comments to the motion? If not, I will ask you to cast your ballots online starting now. I'm in favor because my board docs is outdated apparently. Oh, okay. And as soon as Lisa lets us know the results. Oh, Lisa's microphone is not working again. Lisa, Mr. Workman's Chair, I'm I'm, uh, I'm monitoring Ms. Workman's uh, response here. I'll let you know in just a minute. Yes, I just got a motion, a notion that, and notice that the motion has been defeated. Okay, moving on to the next motion. I shall read the motion that the Upper Canada District School Board places the Ontario Ministry of Education on notice regarding the provincial responsibilities are required to provide the required fiscal infrastructure to implement the health regulations and safety measures advised by Canada's most trusted health experts federally and provincially, namely and most critically, two meters of social distancing and proper ventilation. Under current funding parameters, Upper Canada District School Board staff have done everything possible to mitigate risk, but enhancing existing health and safety measures, including proper spacing and two delivery models requires additional funding. The board therefore declares formerly and unambiguously that return to school directives and allocations provided by the ministry for return to school are inadequate to maximize safety for resumption of classes and does not adequately fund two delivery models online and in person. And I assume moved by Trustee Swan. Do we have a seconder? I hearing none. Hearing none again. Last I'll and final. Get, I'll second it to get the discussion on the floor. <clears throat> okay, that is Trustee Schooler. Schooler. Yeah, okay, thank you. We have the motion on the floor. Any discussion? I, I'd uh, Lisa, like to speak you care to, to it. speak to the motion. Yes, Since go I ahead, please. It, I'd like to speak to it. I know we the, the federal government proposed uh, funding, which is going to the provinces. Um, I can't remember. Our share is 38.1 million for the province of Ontario. The premier of Ontario also said today that we have to ask for additional funding for more teachers, etc. I think it's important. I, I'm welcoming friendly amendments to this emotion. Um, this is I copied actually from the Limestone District School Board with the permission of the trustee who's having it um, read there tonight, Joy, Joy Morning, and I spoke with her today about it. But I think somehow we have to ask for more funding. Our province has not stepped up to the plate enough for making a safe return to school possible. Now we have additional federal funding and if our province steps up to the plate, this return can be as safe as possible for our students and our staff, and we need to ask for the funding A from the province, they, uh, Premier Ford said today, uh, for teachers that he's allocated 70 million for teachers in the province. And uh, I just think it's important to, to pass this to say we aren't getting enough support for safe measures, even though he is saying that we have the safest plan in the country. Thank you.
Mr. Chair, I'm just confirming that you're still online and not muted, sir. I'm still here. Uh, yes, we're ready to take the vote, sorry. Can we not ask for any other comments? I did, or was I muted? There's more buttons here than there is in my combine, trust me. Um, okay, any other comments on the motion? My Question through the chair. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Trustee Jacobs, just a clarification. So this is the, uh, we want to inform the ministry that they are not adequately funding uh, both delivery models that we have our administration uh, implementing. That is one of the intents of my motion. Okay. Um, okay, I believe that was in the final line. Yes. So the, um, I just want to make sure I have everything uh, uh, considered in before I vote. But what's the the other uh, uh, intent through the chair, please? Uh, OK. Physical. Should I be speaking to this? Or are you pa passing this yes, off to the director ahead. or someone? Uh, what, what, the other intent. Am I on or? Mentioned. Yes, you are on. <laughs> Sorry, yes. I get confused too. Too many buttons. The, the other intent was in regards to physical distancing and staffing um, was the big one in regards to the physical distancing and, and funding for our ventilation systems. I mean, it's not going to be done overnight, but I don't think this virus is going overnight either. And we are getting some money, but I think we need to take a stand. Toronto takes stands and they've made changes. They were one of the reasons we got the staggered start date and I think our board needs to take a stand here and just say it's not sufficient because I personally don't think it is and anyway um, that's why I've put this forward. Thank you. Okay um, have we got it up on board docs yet? I'm not seeing it on my page. And OK, Lisa, we are ready to take the vote. So, okay, Mr. Chair, we've noted that. Now. We, we, yes, it is, Mr. Chair. Are you prepared to call the question? Yes, I am prepared to call the question. We ask you to cast your ballots online. Please mark. Please yes. mark me in favor. Uh, Stephen and uh, Lisa. Lisa has lost her, her, her mic contact though. Yes, that's correct, Mr. Chair. We noted uh, Trustee Swan's vote as in favor. Okay. We're waiting, uh, is Mr. Chair, Barry. from Trustee Barry. Okay. Mr. Chair, confirming that the motion was defeated. Uh, Trustee Barry's uh, vote was not taken. OK, motion defeated. And we have one more motion from Trustee Swan. Move that the Upper Canada District School Board deferred a decision for parents to make their final choice of in-person versus online learning until 48 hours after the board communicates what the new proposed back to school model will look like and which addresses the ability to switch between models. Uh, do we have a seconder to the motion?
Do we have a second there to the motion? It's up on your chat line now. Do we have a second there to the motion? Last and final call. Do we have a second here to the motion? Hearing none, the motion dies. Okay. Any further questions or comments to staff about the reports tonight? Uh, I personally have one. Um, and I'll address it to whomever wants to answer. When we live stream elementary classrooms, particularly, what guarantees do we take or measures to protect the privacy of the children in that live stream classroom? Um, could somebody address that for me? Mr. Chair, through you, I'll begin and then I'm going to ask uh, that uh, Superintendent Rudders a uh, comment. Uh, Mr. Chair, our, um, our organization uses the IPC, Information Privacy Commissioner's Toolkit, which is called Privacy by Design. And so what that means, Mr. Chair, and for the trustees, is that when we develop uh, policies, procedures, and practices, we are to inform uh, and, uh, and be influenced by um, those standards that includes uh, efforts to maintain uh, the, the privacy of, um, of the participants uh, in, uh, in our synchronous uh, environments. Members of the board may know that that uh, came forward uh, uh, in the spring when we were running synchronous classrooms uh, during our distance learning model. And as well um, for uh, teachers who are going to be uh, supporting the live streaming, They've also received advice from the Ontario College of Teachers with regards to uh, steps that they should be taking as professionals to maintain uh, the, the privacy and security of the um, proceedings that are being uh, used when, uh, uh, when a uh, live session is being streamed. Apart from that, Mr. Chair, uh, those very general brush strokes, I'll turn it over to Superintendent Rudders to see if she has any other comments. But at this juncture, uh, those are the general brushstrokes that would inform how we've been working uh, with regards to the synchronous environment since the spring and how we would be obliged to continue with those practice. Uh, over to Superintendent Rudders for any other comments that she may like to add. Thank you, uh, Director Sliwa, and through you, Chair. Um, so, you know, Director Sliwa is, is absolutely correct with regards to the guidance that's been provided to our teaching staff provincially through the Ontario College of Teachers. Um, in addition, uh, for a significant number of years, we have had acceptable use policies and, uh, and agreements with our students that we require them to understand and sign um, at the beginning of their journey with us and certainly at the transition points where they move into a new school. Um, and that will continue and those were um, reviewed and revised uh, as part of our engagement with uh, synchronous learning in the latter part of the closure period uh, last school year. We also developed and have published on our website and have shared with all of our teaching staff um, a distance learning guideline for privacy and security and that is a guideline that is um, a, an equal support for our teachers and educators for our students and for our families in terms of what good looks like with regards to engaging in a distance learning um, uh, setting. We also have video conferencing guidelines for students and families and uh, in addition video conferencing guidelines for staff. Um, our appropriate use of technology policy and our code of conduct also apply with regards to how we might address concerns that happen um, to arise in, within uh, a learning environment that is using synchronous online uh, so that our students and families understand our expectations around um, supporting privacy and ensuring that, uh, that we continue to uphold the standards that are outlined in those documents I've referenced. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Uh, Chair, any further questions? 
Yes, go, go ahead, Trustee McRae. Thank you. Um, a week ago, we heard that the Ministry of Health suggested it might be two or three schools per nurse. The next day on the Thursday, I heard them say the figure of three to four schools per nurse. I'd like to say that I believe it's important that um, the, the, the smaller number is preferable. If we need to have an association with coterminous boards or anybody else to put that in place. But I think nurses in schools, there's a limit to how many. OK, thank you, Mr. Chair. OK, before we close the meeting, any further comments or questions? Uh, yes, I have okay. a question. After we see yes, go ahead, the next, Swan. after we see the next model that they're proposing tonight, will we be having a, a board meeting next week, and should we be giving notice now? Uh, that would have to be a discussion at uh, management council. Um, the need for this board meeting came up on the weekend when. There was a major shift in the proposed plan. Um, I'm certain that Director Slewell will inform us if he feels there is a need, and it will be up to the chair, not myself as vice chair, to make that call. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes, it does. Yeah, OK. Okay, Mr. Bill, I have a, I have a question. It's Trustee Dana who's speaking. Is there, yes. is there any? Go ahead, there, Trustee. Thank you. Is, is there any uh, move toward us being able to meet? Like, when when do you think it will be possible for us to meet uh, in person as opposed to virtually? Uh, is there any decision coming up to that? Is the health unit uh, open the door? What are we looking at there? OK, I'm going to ask uh, Director Sliwa to respond to that because he's been counting chairs and he had his uh, tape measure out in the boardroom there last week, so I'll get Stephen to respond. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chair. Through you, uh, as trustees know, uh, the Ministry of Education uh, signaled that with the end of the um, provincial emergency orders that a variety of of uh, offices and institutions could reopen. At the direction of the chair, uh, the chair uh, directed me as secretary of the board to ensure that uh, our first board meeting in September, 9th of September, that Wednesday, uh, would be uh, an in-person meeting. In the meantime, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, you may recall that in our preparation of the boardroom space and indeed uh, all the spaces at the board office, we're confirming what now is maximum capacity as, a rela as it relates to um, the uh, uh, having a proper or appropriate distance. And we also know, Mr. Chair, that um, uh, that in that setting up uh, any kind of uh, distance measures, the other measures that you'll find in our schools will also apply to our workplace setting. And of course, that's the board office, which is um, hand sanitizing and uh, masking and the uh, the self assessment for any COVID like symptoms. Uh, a further information, Mr. Chair, will be coming to trustees uh, by uh, no later than next Wednesday, uh, and that will allow Ms. Workman and I to finalize some discussions with the chair. And from there, the chair will be bringing it forward to uh, uh, to the board of trustees. But just a, a confirmation that the chair has given notice to me as secretary of the board board that he wishes to have the um, uh, the board reconvene um, back to its regular practice of in-person meetings no later than the first board meeting in September, which is September 9th. Thank you. I have, OK, I thank have you. One, yeah. I have one, one last question through you, Chair. Yes, and then I have uh, Trustee Parisian after you. Go thank ahead. You. Um, my question is, and I'm not sure if it's directed to the director or uh, a superintendent. Um, what have we done? I, I, I heard the costing of how expensive it is to, to run the online programs, but what have we done to remove or to look at removing our system teachers that are in the board office 
into classrooms or even virtual classrooms. Thank you. Uh, who cares Mr. to respond to that one? Mr. Yes, Chair, I'd be happy to begin, uh, please, and then I'll ask uh, uh, Superintendent uh, um, uh, Loshaw to uh, comment as well. So uh, just as a starting point, Mr. Chair, uh, I would want to make sure that I would confirm with trustees that we have, um, again, a, a, a dual track operation now that is uh, in place, which is different than uh, where we were last spring. So we have our in-person on-premise um, uh, 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 program, which is our regular day school program. And we, of course, as you heard this evening, we're working on our remote uh, learning program with uh, a number of different variations to that uh, based on the direction from the province. So uh, in the spring, uh, the trustee is quite correct. We deployed all our resources to support the um, uh, the use of our uh, learning partners, learning coaches uh, to help support uh, our schools. And as a matter of fact, they played a significant role in the production of the non-digital workbook, those resources that we were distributing to over 2,000 students uh, during, the, uh, during the spring session. Uh, uh, we are still working on our um, work assignments uh, for our, um, our uh, system level staff, uh, but I, I am very mindful of the fact that the province has also provided nearly a million dollars in um, uh, funding for the grade one to grade eight mathematics program that will by and large become a, a significant part of our learning partners work plus the usual work that the learning partners are assigned around the board improvement uh, plan for a student achievement, which uh, to this uh, moment, the uh, Ministry of Education still has an expectation for, from what I understand with my most uh, recent conversation with Mr. Loshaw, and uh, that we are uh, obviously uh, devoting time for any of our system level um, uh, coaches or learning partners to now uh, uh, support uh, our uh, school-based staff for uh, doing uh, live streaming and then of course for uh, asynchronous uh, digital learning. So there's a lot of things that have been brought to these people's plates uh, that they'll actually be supporting. Uh, they'll be actually supporting uh, the, uh, uh, the the remote learning part. So I'm just going to turn it over to Mr. Loshaw for a moment to ask if he has anything else he'd like to uh, bridge in terms of that response or if I've missed any key elements. Thank you, Director Sliwa, and uh, through you, Vice Chair McPherson. Um, earlier today, uh, uh, you would have referred to Superintendent, or you would have uh, heard Superintendent Hobbs refer to priority and partnership funding, and that's funding that our board receives uh, from the Ministry of Education specifically for a number of initiatives. And uh, to provide you with uh, an example of what some of those are, uh, our director referenced the new math curriculum. We would also receive uh, funding for Indigenous education, experiential learning, and a variety of curriculum areas that fund the position specifically for our system staff that uh, Trustee Swan referred to. And our, our director also referred to the nature of the work that our system staff are involved in. And uh, certainly um, we would look at taking a, a coordinated and integrated approach to the way in which we would need to support our system right now in terms of building the capacity of their use with technology and good instructional practices with regard to the way in which uh, we are uh, the model that we are considering. Thank you. OK, uh, Trustee Prejean, you have a comment. Yes, thank you. Through you, Chair. Um, I received a, a inquiry from a parent during the meeting, and um, they're just wondering if they would, if there would be, if the board would be releasing an update, pros and cons before their decision by uh, next Friday morning, or sorry, this Friday morning. Okay, uh, Director Sliwa, could you respond? Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Uh, uh, it's quite apparent to staff this evening that uh, we will want to continue to update parents about uh, what's uh, on the horizon in terms of the work that we're doing. Uh, 
I, I do believe that that would be uh, something that we could commit to and post on our um, school reopening page and uh, alert parents through our um, uh, through our, um, uh, our my family room portal so they also have that reference point we understand that families are trying to make some decisions and uh, since the the online uh, virtual learning and the different variations of that synchronous and asynchronous may not be so familiar to, to families we're happy to, to uh, produce some resource within the next 24 hours to make sure it's up there and posted great thank okay. you okay thank Thank you. Uh, Trustee McDonald, I uh, have you queued up here. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is around the same um, or similar. Uh, the communication went out um, very alarming to parents about having to make the choice um, and being, uh, or it appeared anyway, that they were going to be um, stuck with that choice with uh, uh, whether they choose to be in a virtual or in a classroom environment. The clarification was provided this evening. Is there going to be clarification uh, communication sent to parents as well? OK, Director Sliwa, can you respond? Thank you, Mr. Chair. My pleasure to do so. That would be absolutely the right thing to do, and we'd be happy to make sure we provide that to families who didn't have a chance to dial into this evening's proceedings. OK. Thank you. Any further comments or questions before we adjourn this meeting? Thank you all for taking time out of your calendars tonight for this. And I have a motion moved by Trustee Prejean, seconded by Trustee McCray, that the special meeting and public session of the Upper Kansas District School Board, August the 26th, 2020, be adjourned at 8.46 p.m. All those in favor, uh, just shout it, point, show of hands, whatever. Trustee Jacobs in favor. McCray in favor. Swan in okay, favor. got two. Okay, any opposed? If not, I shall declare the motion carried. Meeting adjourned. Thank you for attending tonight. Good job. Yeah, thank you.